this video I want to talk about the HK USP 40, the design, and one of the reasons why it's almost the perfect 40 caliber, maybe not exactly, but it does have some advantages over certain other pistols such as the uh, uh, P229 and even the uh, USP Compact. Now, uh, that means that I'm specifically talking about the full size. Now, this is the original that was designed around the 40 caliber and the birth of the USP 9mm and the USP 45. This was the pistol that went through all the, tr the tough trials, you know, uh, sticking around in the bore and firing it off, doing a lot of the tests that were uh, put um, on the Mark 25. It was designed to maximize uh, the life of the pistol uh, from the 40 caliber cartridge and they crossed it over seeing uh, how well it performed and it is kind of a dated design however I think that it is still relevant the aftermarket uh, giving this rail a second chance at life and you know general stuff like that I think uh, the general characteristics of this pistol and its modularity actually uh, kind of help this pistol stay current. However, with everything, there are some downsides and kind of weird design features that uh, sounded like a good idea at the time, but may not actually play out in um, making this pistol like a universally good pistol. But at the time, the name USP Universal Service Pistol, or self-loading pistol, my bad, uh, universal being that military, law enforcement, and civilians alike will find that this pistol will meet almost every need, uh, except for a few that HK has done when they go up to generations like the uh, uh, P2000, the P30, etc., VP9, you know, stuff like that, where they've taken, you know, the good design features of, of this platform that they've learned and actually carried them on as best they can, although there are compromises along the way. This is one of those um, pistols that HK, well, one of the only pistols that I've seen in the HK uh, uh, lineup in my experience that actually has very little compromise just a couple things here and there so <clears throat> in general this thing is very story for its uh, durability in pretty much all calibers and you know it's a very well respected pistol but there are downsides and I want to go ahead and talk about the general design and why I think it is probably one of the best options if you're going to get it if you're going to get a 40 caliber get a USP if you're going to get a reliable firearm that you can you know trust and then <clears throat> I, I would say stick with the full size USP, and uh, you know it, it's really not that big of a deal. We'll talk about uh, why it is pretty much universal even for concealed carry. So, anyways, the first thing I want to talk about is utilitarian. That actually goes into ergonomics and uh, uh, basically uh, almost everything about this pistol. Now, first things first, the grip here. Now, me being uh, you know, having relatively small hands. Um, this grip almost fits uh, at the limit of, you know, my grip ability. The USP 45 that I've ha I had around for a while and before I sold it, um, I had a little bit of an issue. I was barely able to actually uh, get to the trigger uh, on the traditional double single action uh, uh, version. So um, I had an issue with that, uh, barely being able to reach the trigger without gloves on this one is just within the range of being able to use a gloved hand. Now, granted, I'm, I'm not really a, that big of a guy, and I don't really have the biggest of hands. I fit into a size small on some of the gloves, uh, actually a lot of the gloves, so it's not really the um, most ergonomic and smallest grip um, possible, but I still am able to uh, get good results and uh, able to perform with this pistol and uh, be able to manipulate this pistol just as good as any other. It's just... Um, it, it basically falls just within that range. Now, if the hammer is all the way forward, it pushes the trigger all the way forward, and therefore my grip, I'm barely getting, you know, the first third of my finger on there. However, when it's at half cock and I touch it back, I'm, I can actually get to the joint, uh, and then I can pull from there, which is basically what you want with a double action pistol. Pardon me, I got the shakes from having so much coffee. Uh, but uh, anyways... Uh, it's a very utilitarian gun. It does have a relatively aggressive uh, texturing on the front and back, and it, it doesn't cut up your hand or anything like that, and uh, it's not really that big of a deal. The sides are, you know, just enough, but when you're wearing gloves, this actually gets a very good grip, and it's very utilitarian in nature. The, 
the slide is pretty bulky, it has just enough serrations to grab a hold of it. It's got very um, good sized controls that stick out just enough for gloved hands, so uh, very easy to use under stress, working very fast. If you haven't trained much under stress, you're going to need um, pretty good sized controls for swiping things and, you know, uh, sacrificing uh, strength and precision for speed. Um, that can take a, that can come you know, you, you can become better with dexterity under after having a lot of training and uh, training your body to instinctively be able to do things. So uh, that's one thing a lot of people don't touch on. Uh, they talk about universally that stress is going to, you know, take away everybody's ability to function, and I just haven't seen that to be the case in my experience with uh, stressful situations. However, um, the controls are pretty ergonomic where they need to be, and the versions that this uh, pistol has, like the uh, LEM version, make this a very... Uh, easy pistol to use for both left and right handed shooters except for the slide you know release and it is designed to be a release and you know uh, typically you're just going to be uh, wanting to rack the uh, slide and uh, send it into battery anyways and slingshot and not ease it forward obviously but very utilitarian in nature and in design basically do the job and holster so anyways the modular trigger configuration, as I was talking about earlier, actually lends this thing to be still applicable today and to be able to cater to a wide variety of shooters. You can even get ambidextrous uh, uh, controls uh, as far as, you know, these are concerned, the decocker safety, you know, whatever. Uh, slide release, uh, that was a complaint that some people had. They wanted it ambidextrous so they can use it on both sides. There are ways to get around that and ways to manipulate it, like with your trigger finger and stuff like that, and it is... Uh, far enough forward and far enough back that if you're, you know, right-handed, uh, sometimes people can actually reach that. Of course, I got small hands, so I can only really uh, reach that part. But you know, it, it's still applicable today, and people adapt to other firearms uh, that are of a similar design, mostly catered to right-handers. The magazine release is very instinctive for both left and right-handers because you use your trigger finger to eject the magazine. I would not put the extension on there because it has a piece of metal <clears throat> that locks into this polymer magazine, which I think was one of the uh, design parts that I'll discuss later where I think um, maybe they could have advanced on that or changed it along the way, but they didn't. But we'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit. So uh, I, I think that the modular uh, trigger configurations and the ease at which that you, you can change this out um, make it a very adaptable pistol and still relevant today. It's just one of the features that I feel like keep it a, uh, keep it relevant today. So, anyways, the next thing I want to talk about is the recoil reduction system. Now, this is one thing that makes it still unique today, which I think keeps it at competitive in the market. I don't see any other pistols doing this necessarily. There are some copies. Uh, the Turkish company uh, Sarsmaz actually has kind of uh, copied this uh, design feature to basically uh, reduce the recoil, and I think that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with there being clones, but as long as they do it right and they uh, do a good justice, which I think Sarsamons did a pretty good job at that from what I've noticed. Now, with this recoil reduction system, you've got a moderate uh, spring tension here, just enough to put it in the battery with a little extra force. However, you have this extra piece right here, double a, a, a second spring, which is a lot more powerful, has, or at least has a lot more weight. And the way this works, a lot of people haven't really touched on this. They just think this compresses in uh, this way, and this part doesn't move. However, the whole recoil spring assembly, you see this extra room here between the uh, little camming, cyst, uh, camming block and the uh, frame? Yeah, it can go back. See that little bit of motion? It's a lot of pressure to actually get it to go rearward, and that's by design. This is actually a spring that's good for the 9mm and the 40 caliber. You can get tactical versions for a suppressor since it's going to kick back a lot more, supposedly, and uh, you'll get more rearward pressure from suppressors, but um, generally speaking, this is a very, a, a very easy recoiling uh, system and in fact I actually have some shooting video that I'll go ahead and roll in right now comparing this against a uh, another nine millimeter of similar you know size and weight
Now in the video it may have been hard to see, but uh, the USB 40 actually had less, um, I, I feel like it had less muzzle rise and uh, stuff like that from the um, uh, from the little Beretta 92FS um, as far as like recoil and snap, uh, as far as muzzle flip and snap rather. But I feel that this is a very controllable pistol. It's insensitive to you know higher pressure at ammunition, which is something that this does above all other pistols so far. Now HK has uh, uh, simplified this to basically put a nylon buffer between uh, this part of the frame and you know the where the slide's going to hit to try because nylon will compress just slightly, so it should dampen the. Of forces here and plus they have metal reinforcements in this area on the side so they kind of feel like they can compromise in that uh, area and they don't lose that much however you do notice a big difference and so uh, I, this is a pretty good size slide in the nine millimeter they actually have a cutout in in this area right here to lighten up the slide you got to have a kind of a beefy slide to increase the weight to handle the 40 caliber it is a higher pressure than the 45 and the nine millimeter put together However, standard pressure um, 40 caliber almost comes in at the same, um, I, I guess you could say, pressures and uh, you know kick as a nine millimeter plus P, uh, generally speaking. So if you're uh, against 40 caliber because of the recoil, you might want to consider the fact that, uh, generally speaking, the pressures and the and the stress that's going to be put on the guns from a nine millimeter that's not stammy spec or is like 9mm NATO or just plus P in general, uh, 40 caliber is basically like having a steady diet of plus P. And there's pistols out there like the 96, um, Breda 96 uh, FS and stuff like that. Uh, even the 92 FS, it shares the same frame, so it gives it good longevity. It makes it uh, able to fire a steady diet of plus P and stuff like that. Internal components aren't really affected by it, but this was designed from the ground up to handle all types of 40 caliber in it, so it's actually proven itself to last tens of thousands of rounds without needing any part changes that are extreme. This where the recoil reduction system comes in because this absorbs a lot of the shock, but these springs are stay pretty tight for a long time. And this doesn't have to really be changed out until 20, 30,000 rounds, depending on how you're using it, how fast you're firing the heat exchanged into the springs and stuff, because heat can change the uh, strength of the metallurgy over time. So that's a big consideration. I know I'm kind of rambling a bit, but um, there's a lot of information that uh, a lot of people kind of miss out on, or there's just not that much information on the web about these kinds of things. So I just wanted to touch on that a bit. So now I'll go ahead and put this together. And now, uh, I want to go ahead and touch on the magazine. See, this is a polymer magazine. A lot of people say it's just straight polymer. There's actually no metal reinforcement. However, it's proven wrong. When you look here at the feed lips, you do see metal on the inside here. It goes down to about, you know, this area right here, just to the top for integrity and stuff like that. So it, at the bottom, you know, half or bottom two thirds, it doesn't really have much of any reinforcement. So that is kind of a downside. Glock did a pretty good job of having metal on the inside, but very rarely have you heard any complaints about this. However, this is one thing that uh, I have noticed. Um, this is a, it looks like 1994 maybe um, is the date of production for this magazine. I don't really know how to read all this, so you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, so it looks like this is a very old version of the um, magazines, and this thing was a law enforcement trade, and uh, it came with three magazines that were all like this for the most part. And uh, if you know anything about law enforcement, they typically have uh, their pistols loaded uh, for a good amount of time. Uh, and that can do stuff to the springs and, and uh, whether a lot of people like it or not, that actually does play, uh, play a part in you know, the life of the magazine springs. Um, some pistols less than others and different types of springs will last to, to different types of life. Maybe they'll need more compression and you know, going up and down in order to wear it. <clears throat> But it, there's a lot about springs that we are still screwing around with in order to find the best way to give it the best life. And uh, it, metallurgy is a fine science in and of itself that we're finding. We're constantly making advancements, being able to add things to it, reinforce them in certain ways. So 
the, this is like the weak link, uh, if anything, of the USP, except for maybe the trigger spring, which I've had to replace before. Uh, it's one of the highest wear points, especially if you're dry firing a lot in magazines. Uh, they'll last a little good amount of time, but I'm even having some issues with these things, you know, locking open on the last shot fired. So if I eject the magazine, it's good to go. Uh, this is one of the only real reliable magazines uh, out of the three. So just keep that in mind that you might want to carry just springs around. Uh, the follower will stay good for almost like forever, but I would just get extra springs from HK parts. The parts on this pistol are not that inexpensive. However, the life that you'll get out of them is very good and I would just say uh, keep around some magazine springs if you shoot a lot or you're going to carry it and also keep around trigger springs and practice with it of course. So next thing is reliability and durability. So reliability, uh, reliability wise it, it, HK ha is renowned for actually having very reliable pistols as far as uh, maintaining function and stuff like that and uh, when it comes to you know uh, dealing with a uh, hard fouling, if you will, of foreign debris and stuff like that. It does uh, generally have a good reputation for functioning, and this was one of the pistols that was put through its own trials uh, for NATO testing in order to pass uh, all that stuff being frozen, having sand around and stuff like that. Military Arms Channel tested the USP-45, and it did pretty well through his little uh, test there. Um, However, different environments are going to present different challenges, different consistencies in foreign debris, uh, and stuff like that. It just depends on how you're using it. And reliability is very subjective to the weapon's condition and what it's being put through. So just keep that in mind. And also the different types of rounds you're using. And, uh, you know, if it's completely flat, like a complete wad cutter or something like that, that could affect certain things. But generally speaking, HK does a very good job of making sure that these things are incredibly reliable before putting them on the market, say for maybe the VP9, where they were having some issues with durability. And that brings us to durability. This is... Uh, if you read through the uh, actual manual, they, they really like to brag about the testing that this pistol has been through and vetted, uh, very similar to the Mark 23. They wanted to prove this to the U.S. market to actually be able to sustain a long service life with the 40 caliber, which is excellent. Very few companies will do that. Typically, they uh, just scale up the barrel size and maybe the extractor or something and maybe the weight of the slide to um, deal with the 40 caliber. Sometimes you get different spring weights, but generally speaking, the size of it and the density of the metal is not actually enough to actually um, deal with even 9mm plus P steady diets, which is basically standard SAMI pressure for 40 caliber. So you just got to keep that in mind that this pistol was designed around the 40 caliber. It's one of the first pistols. Six hour followed with their P229, but they still do have issues with like springs and stuff like that. The limitations on the construction of their frames and stuff like that. Uh, as far as uh, being able to handle the 40 caliber, they just had some limitations and they haven't really done too much as far as I remember to actually counter some of the um, metallurgy issues. And uh, they... I, I think that SIG is just like, well, it does fine enough and you can just replace the parts. Uh, compared to the USP or any HK pistol, the parts on six hours are actually relatively cheap. It's not exactly the magazines, but, you know, again, if you get, you know, different springs, then you should be good to go. And they'll generally be less expensive I, uh, from what I've found. So, also... I think that the uh, finish on the USP is uh, no better or worse than uh, any other pistol. It, it does lend itself to utilitarian use. However, the internal components and also like the extractor, you see this thing is oxidized and it's actually been affected by some time, moisture, uh, condensation, or whatever you want to call it. The internal components uh, can look very similar from my experience. So I'm going to have to break this down again to kind of show you guys. But <clears throat> it's not exactly rust proof. Now, this uh, does oxidize a bit, but it's not going to really rust. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. If it looks a little ugly, it doesn't mean that it's rusting. However, however, uh, this finish does not make it impervious to rust. There could be oxidation or uh, standing uh, moisture, and uh, you can get a little bit of um, buildup as far as rust, but it's not going to eat away into the finish from my experience. Even if uh, this wears down, it actually goes pretty deep into the metal. But uh, HK likes to, you know, give their stuff their its own name, like uh, Hustle Environment Finish and stuff like that, instead of just saying it's a nitrite finish or how they actually do it, you know, um, acid, uh, acid nitriding, you know, uh, plasma or, or whatever their uh, specific, uh, you know, design is for the finish. 
Last thing to cover is really the price and uh, you know the availability of these pistols. They're going to come in at like between seven and a thousand dollars, seven hundred and a thousand dollars typically. But a lot of people want uh, that assured um, comfort, basically, that these pistols are reliable. However, I'm not really into spending that much money. But and there are uh, these pistols that have served in U.S. law enforcement, and they are coming back on the market because of age and stuff like that. This is a law enforcement trade-in, and you can see that it's had a good amount of wear. It's had a good amount of service life. It's um, been on somebody's uh, rig and, you know, dealt with a lot of condensation. And it had, like, some grip tape on the sides when I first got it. And you can see it's seen a good amount of wear and usage uh, with me. And, uh, yeah, it, I mean, there's uh, certain USP 45s that were on the market that were uh, used if you find a used gun. Um, uh, certain things like HK Specialist Store, they had a lot of uh, good prices on some uh, used H&Ks, and one of them was like a USP 45. However, again, if you're going to go with a uh, an HK, I would get the full-size USP. You're taking basically everything as far as the durability and availability of parts for the most part, and uh, you know, you're just sacrificing if your hands are a little bit small. It may not be perfect as far as being small and the most comfortable. However, it points very straight and it's very uh, comfortable to shoot. Once you start shooting it, you're going to really love uh, how it feels. And once you get past that first double action pull, this pistol does not take very much to, you know, as far as uh, you reset queens out there, I'm not one of them. Um, you know, it has a pretty short reset, and even, you know, after it resets, there's not much of any slop. So, it resets before the full extension of the single action trigger. So, you know, it actually lends itself to being shot uh, fairly well, fairly quickly. So, you know, uh, for all of you out there that are looking for a good durable pistol, especially in 40 caliber, I don't think 40 caliber is dead. This takes away a lot of the disadvantages. Some people uh, feel that the terminal ballistics are not really that great. However, 40 caliber is still doing really good in barrier penetration, etc., etc., and still is uh, one of the leaders as far as legacy ammo uh, when it comes to barrier penetration and terminal effects and just reliable uh, terminal performance. Uh, 9mm still has yet to catch up uh, with their like hydroshocks and uh, some of their late legacy ammunition like golden sabers and stuff. Um, 40 caliber still meets the FBI requirements for damn near every uh, legacy hollow point out there. Not talking about like the HSTs and stuff like that, but general non bonded ammunition that's uh, standard like uh, Remington, UMC, jacketed hollow points, or uh, uh, Winchester white box, uh, those actually fall within the terminal performance or requirements for the FBI, which is interesting because that's actually what the 40 caliber was designed around in order to get that kind of performance. So uh, I think 40 is a very viable cartridge. I think the USP is a very viable uh, pistol for pretty much anything, duty, concealed carry, and stuff like that. And this really is not that big of a pistol. I'm actually able to fit 14 rounds in the magazine plus one, uh, which is damn near the same as the USP 9. It's still more than the uh, USP 45. And it comes in at 5.3 inches, which is the same size as the Walther PPQ. Uh, I think the PPQ is just a little bit uh, taller, and even in the 40 caliber setting, it doesn't really uh, control recoil as much, handle it, and have as uh, good of a lifespan, uh, depending on how you shoot, if you want that peace of mind or whatever. Then this actually comes in at about the same size, and you know it, it's actually pretty easy to carry. It's really not that heavy. So anyways, I appreciate you guys watching this. If you watch it in... Uh, through its entirety, I very much appreciate it. Go to my blog at doitright.org, and you guys have a good one.